Hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Well, that line is seriously going to date this episode. But this is Jamie. You've made it to the Everything 80s podcast movie review. And today we're doing The Goonies, the classic from 1985. So we're going to look at, you know, the plot, the breakdown, some behind the scenes things, some of the themes, overall impressions, everything like that. So before we get started, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. I should be there. Okay, so let's look into this. So The Goonies, of course, the 1985 adventure comedy film is co-produced and directed by Richard Donner, who made the first Superman movie. It's a screenplay written by Chris Columbus and based on a story by executive producer, of course, Steven Spielberg, and based on a story called The Goon Children that Christopher Columbus, if you don't know him, he made all the Harry Potter movies, he made Home Alone, he made Gremlins, so took some of these sort of old ideas and made them into modern classics at the time. So some of the cast in it, a lot of amazing young actors who became, you know, real superstars in their own right. Sean Astin, who plays Mikey, Josh Brolin, plays uh, Brand, you got Jeff Cohen as Chunk, Corey Feldman as Clark Mouth Devereaux, Carrie Green, Martha Plimpton, a ton of great actors. And again, a ton of great young actors that really brought this uh, energy and enthusiasm to the movie. So looking at the plot, so we start with a area called the Goondocks, which is in Astoria, Oregon. And it's this foreclosure coming to the homes of the people who live in this area as they're trying to open it like a country club, expand this country club. So a group of children who live in this area, they call themselves the Goonies. So they, because they think everything's falling apart and their lives are going to have to change, they gather for one final weekend together. So the Goonies include a good range of sort of characters and dynamics and different, and this sort of incorporates different sort of personality themes. So you've got the optimist in Mikey, you got his older brother, Brandon, you've got uh, Data, who's the inventive one, the talkative one they call Mouth. You have the, you know, sort of overweight kid who's the klutz that they call Chunks, all these different sort of comments comedy and um, uh, narrative tropes in all representing all these characters. So they're rummaging through the attic at the Walsh's and they come across a um, this sort of little drawing map thing from 1632 and it's basically a treasure map and it's about the the famous pirate One-Eyed Willie and his hoard of treasure that's located somewhere nearby. So Mikey considers this One-Eyed Willie to be the original Goonie. He was one of the guys who sort of founded this era and then that persona. So the kids have to evade uh, Brandon and make their way to the abandoned restaurant on the coast that coincides with the map as they see how everything links up. Brandon soon follows alongside Andy, uh, a cheerleader who has a crush on him. And then there's also Steph, who's Andy's friend. So the, the group quickly discovers that this sort of rundown restaurant is a hideout of the Fratelli crime family. So that's made up of Francis, Jake, and their mother, they just call Mama. The Goonies find a tunnel in the basement of the restaurant and follow it, but Chunk is captured by the Fratellis and in prison, and we meet the deformed and super strong uh, younger brother called Sloth. The Fratellis intimidate Chunk until he reveals where the Goonies have gone, and then they begin their pursuit. So Chunk is left behind with Sloth, but they end up becoming friends. After Sloth frees both of them, Chunk calls the police and he and Sloth follow the Fratellis. So the Goonies now evade several different uh, booby traps that are, you know, laid in the tunnels and try to keep ahead of the Fratellis the whole time. Finally, they reach the grotto where Willie's pirate ship, which is called the Inferno, is still anchored there. The group discovers the ship is filled with all this treasure and they start filling their own pockets. But Mikey warns them about not... Um, taking any set of scales in front of Willie by considering that to be their tribute to him. They still want to be respectful of the past and to the person they consider the original Goonie. So as they end up leaving the ship, the Fratellis appear and 
basically take all their stolen loot away from them. They make the Goonies end up walking the plank until Chunk arrives with Sloth. He distracts the Fratellis long enough for the Goonies to jump overboard. So the Fratellis then proceed to grab all the treasure that they can, including those on Willie's scales. So that ends up triggering another booby trap that causes the entire like grotto cave area to completely cave in. So then with Sloth's help, the Goonies and the Fratellis escape just barely. Then the two groups, they emerge on Astoria's beach where they reunite with all the families of the Goonies and the police who have shown up and everything. The Fratellis are then arrested, but Chunk is able to help stop Sloth from having to be taken away too and then invites Sloth to live with him, which he ends up accepting. So the kids then describe this whole adventurous um, pursuit they've been on to their parents. Then Mikey discovers that his marble bag is filled with gems he took from the ship that had not been taken by the Fratellis. So Mikey's father triumphantly rips up the foreclosure papers, declaring that they now have enough money to negotiate on the foreclosure in the area. So then everyone celebrates, the Goonies celebrate, they've saved the day, and then they see the Inferno, which has now broken free from the grotto during the collapse, and they see it sailing off into the distance on its own. So let's look at some behind the scenes things and, you know, lots of little facts that went into the making of the Goonies. So the first thing, like, so it comes out on June 7th, 1985, has a pretty good critical response, especially from notable hard ass critic Roger Ebert, who thought everything they were going for as far as the adventure aspect and the comedy and the fun and all that, they really nailed. So it makes $9 million its opening weekend, which is good at the time and remember like movies are opening on way less theaters and then of course like taking in inflation into account but it opens second behind the always confusingly named rambo first blood part two but would end up again being a relatively not not a massive blockbuster but decent and it stayed in the ended up as uh, in the top 10 of all money-making movies for 1985. It made $124 million on a budget of just $19 million, so a financial hit. And obviously in the years, it would become more of a beloved, even like a cult classic, if you will. I don't know if you can go all the way to call it a cult classic because it is so well-known. <clears throat> but like I said, it was in the top 10 of those movies in 1985. And you consider that year we had Back to the Future, we had Rambo, we had Rocky IV, The Color Purple, Cocoon. So it was in pretty good company. So a lot has been made note of uh, over the course of the filming of the movie that the kids were like, pretty rambunctious, not necessarily tough to deal with, but when you throw a bunch of these kids together, it is pretty chaotic. So sometimes it was harder to you know, capture their attention perfectly. And they ended up shooting the movie in chronological order. They thought that way the kids would be able to focus better on how the movie and the plot was unfolding. It was something Spielberg was big on with kids. He thought it was better for them to know where everything was going. And he did it famously in E.T., especially with like the younger actors and like Drew Barrymore because they were able to follow where everything was going instead of jumping around from scene to scene. So a good incident of that as far as trying to capture their attention perfectly is the scene where the kids see One-Eyed Willie's pirate ship for the first time. That's all happening Again, in real time, none of the kid actors had seen the set or the newly constructed pirate ship. So what you're seeing on film is their genuine reactions. And Richard Donner thought th these type of approaches were good because it was so hard to, again, like harness all the crazy enthusiasm from the kids. So it was better to like put them in these genuine situations. So if you watch the movie back, watch their reactions and like they're seeing it for the first time as we're watching them. So interesting thing, like the movie was finished pretty quickly it was uh they filmed it in just around five months but what took a lot longer was the audio dubbing over the film because there was so much dialogue and editing that had to be done that took si over six months to do so longer than the filming period there's a great line with um sean astin 
if you watch Stranger Things season two, if you remember Sean Astin playing the character Bob, when they're looking at the maps being drawn out by Will, and then he remarks about what's at the end, pirate treasure. So a good call back to the Goonies. Speaking speaking of Sean Astin, this is amazing. And I saw this on the uh, part of the deleted scenes and commentary for the Goonies. The whole monologue that Sean Astin gives about One-Eyed Willie was completely unscripted. And he just like improv that whole thing, which is nuts. And also pretty incredible for a child actor, first to pull that off and second to have the confidence to do that in a major movie with all these people around. So that sort of speaks to how great Sean Astin is. There was a lot of buzz about the Goonies when it was being made. And it was attracting a lot of like big time Hollywood stars because they wanted to see what this was. Like this had a lot of the hype of going into 1985. So people like Harrison Ford would show up, Dan Aykroyd would show up, Paul Rubens would show up as Pee Wee Herman, a way to help (laughs) the kids settle into things. Even Michael Jackson would come around. Like this was the, the hot set because they, I don't know, people... I don't know what Hollywood buzz like before, obviously, um, internet and blogs and movie blogs. So word of mouth would spread around and they're like, this thing's going to be pretty big and you might want to associate yourself with it. So let's look at some of the themes that happened during the Goonies. And it, you might like, if you take the movie at face value, you might not see that there's actually any general themes, but there are some basic ones that I think the movie um, portrays very well. So the simplest one is well a lot of them are simple but at its core goonies is about friendship and then from there it branches off into some of those classic hero type narratives and that first one being the importance of courage and i felt this was used in the portrayal of the goonie kids to help influence the younger audience they knew would be watching it you know the movie helps to inspire and encourage these acts of courage even though they are super tough um, that's what it takes. It sometimes it takes that leap, and it has to. You have to get out of your comfort zone, and I think that was one of the services they did to the young audience watching, as reflected through the characters taking those leaps of courage. There's of course a classic good versus evil theme running throughout the movie. You know, it's that's always going to be a basic premise for films of this nature. But I think in the case of the Goonies, one of the big themes it looks at is the issue of greed, and they look at the, you know, money is great and it can provide, can provide a lot of things, but the problem is how much is enough. The desire for it to bring you all its great benefits can easily be outweighed by greed. And I think that's explored through the movie. And I think the Fratellis represent greed in this movie while the kids reject the, this mindset. They see the importance of money and, you know, financial stability and all that stuff, but they know where to draw the line between needing what's good enough and then pushing it too far. Far And the Fratellis, I believe, represent that idea of, you know, corporate greed or whatever it is, as far as, you know, that, you know, trying to take down the goondocks area and expanding the country club and stuff. So I think a few of those different themes run throughout the movie. I think one of the big takeaways, and again, a a very basic theme, but that's been explored very well through the Goonies, is just the idea about youth itself. And the movie is about the, the hope of youth and everything like that. The Goonies represent the hopes, the dreams, the fears that everyone has, but especially at a point in life before you've seen much of the world or even seen life itself. They're, you know, this sort of wide-eyed enthusiasm they're going in and everyone can see themselves in those characters and, you know, the importance of youth and the importance of staying inspired and positive. And I, I also feel the quest for the treasure in the movie is represented a few different ways. As much, you know, as they're looking for actual physical treasure, the the theme that runs through the movie is the quest for the, like those own treasures in your life, such as, you know, finding courage, wanting to do great things, being a hero to the friends and those around you. So the treasure is representative um, through, through the actual physical financial jewels and gold and everything like that, but also these like internal treasures the kids are able to discover 
on the quest to finding the treasure. I really think the Goonies, like, I mean, there's so many amazing movies of the 80s. That's why I'm doing all these movie reviews on here. But, like, the Goonies, like, I don't know. When some people are trying to pick one movie to represent the 80s, the Goonies comes up more often than not. Obviously, you know, Back to the Future's in there, E.T.'s in there, Indiana Jones, all those things. But, like, the Goonies captures that sort of, you know, again, like I said, the wide-eyed enthusiasm, uh, the, you know, hopefulness, youth, all that stuff. And again, it sort of wraps it up in this uh, sort of like a kid's Indiana Jones, this classic adventure, which have always been amazing narratives throughout, you know, early film and television, and they still work today. And in the 80s, I think we really got a good sort of, um, you know, embrace of that classic, you know, sort of swashbuckling treasure hunt pirate theme. And again, like the kids, the, it was one of those movies where you're watching these kids that seem exactly like the kids you knew, and you felt like you were watching yourself on screen. And the movie still holds up well today because it's got that energy. It's got that enthusiasm. And it doesn't matter if a movie's, you know, two years old or 50 years old, that spirit is still within it. And I think that's why Goonies is one of the all-time classics. So that'll be it for me. Thank you for listening to this Everything 80s podcast movie review. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to this. I know there's a ton of podcasts out there, so the fact you listen to this one means a lot. Make sure you subscribe and wherever you find your podcast. That way you um, stay up to date with all the episodes. If you're new here, check out the back catalog. I've got every topic you could think of covered you know, regarding the 80s, like movies, TV shows, toys, video games, electronics, all that great stuff. But thank you for your time and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.